Well, here we are, chapter 11. Um, I think this is probably one of the, the, the hardest chapters to really to really understand. In fact, it might take uh, might take a while for this all to sink in. But um, now we're going to talk about and so talk about the details about risk and more of a, on a terminology kind of a basis. We're going to take a step and we're talking about actually measuring um, measuring risk and return uh, to see how we might utilize that in decision making. So first of all, uh, if you think about in general the uh, um, the idea of of investors and what investors think about riskiness itself, um, economists typically categorize individuals uh, the the way we think people normally think. The, we refer to people as rational investors. Their attitude towards risk is one where they require return as compensation for increases in risk. So when risk increases, a risk-averse person will want or desire a higher rate of return. Now, each one of us has different levels of sensitivity, though. So some people will want more, some people will want less. But in general, a rational investor wants to be compensated for taking risks. A risk-neutral person is a person that, quite frankly, for one reason or another, doesn't pay attention to risk. They just don't care about risk. Um, I think this is probably, uh, again, a little bit of an opinion, but I think this is one of the issues with uh, American investors right now, is that we, we, we think of investing as a consumer thinks. Uh, we think about getting the benefits, as much benefit as we can, and we don't think about the other factors, the other variables, namely being risk. <clears throat> and risk-seeking is really a gambling mentality. So that's where a person really wants greater risk with lower returns. And essentially that is the definition of, of gambling, is that uh, you actually expect to lose money, and there's a risk that you'll do that. So uh, that is uh, gambling, if you will. <clears throat> so we're going to look at a variety of approaches of how, how to measure and, and quantify risk. So the first thing we'll talk about is something called scenario analysis. We're going to look at some possible alternatives, and we're going to try to calculate some statistics based on whether or not uh, the returns that we see, or the returns that we expect, are either really good returns, low returns, or optimistic. So they talk about here placing some uh, uh, projections and refer to them as being the worst, the most likely, or the optimistic outcomes. And then, of course, looking at the uh, statistics of that. Now, range is a basic measure of risk. If you subtract the worst thing from the highest thing. The challenge is, I mean, obviously, that uh, um, it has very little statistical inference to it. But, of course, the greater the distance, the more things that can happen to you, you know, the greater the risk there is. <clears throat> so here we have a company. They want to choose the better of two investments. They have A and B. Um, they're going to spend 10000 on each. And as you can see here, we have some potential outcomes. In a pessimistic environment, um, the uh, asset A expects to get 13%, and the most likely 15%, and then the optimistic 17%. <clears throat> Excuse me. And of course, you can see that the difference, the range, 17 minus 13, is 4. And then we have 7% is the pessimistic for B, 15% is most likely, 23% is the optimistic, and for B, the range here is 16. So let's talk about how ultimately we're going to measure uh, the riskiness of these two investments. The first thing we need to talk about is some form of probability. We have to predict the chance that those outcomes will occur. Now, typically, it's done with some type of a survey, um, but it can be rather subjective. Um, so, again, we just want to determine as best we possibly we can what is the chance of a certain economic environment. And, again, not the easiest thing to do. Um, an economics course might help us with that. 
certainly a statistics course might give us some tools to help with that. We're going to assume that uh, Norman's company has estimates, and they think that it's 25, 50, and 25 percent, um, respectively. So when you add those all up, it's 100 percent. So that means we're we're going to uh, all of the potential outcomes of this uh, these assets are taken into account. So what do we want to calculate? What do we want to do? We really are looking for two primary statistics at this time. We're looking for something called standard deviation. It's the most common statistical indicator. It measures dispersion. This word dispersion is very important. How are things spread out? The expected value is like the average or the mean. And there's some formulas here for return. It's the weighted product of the returns and the probabilities. Now, if you want to do some historical analysis, if you calculate monthly returns for the last two, three years, you can figure out the average monthly return by taking the sum of all those returns and dividing it by n. So there is a historical calculation we can use, and there's also um, a predictive model, if you will. <clears throat> so standard deviation, again, is the calculation looks a little bit on the ugly side, right? But it really looks at differences. Here's where that idea of dispersion comes in. The average return is R bar, and RJ is the event. So how are these things spread out? How far are they? And again, this is for the predictive model, and this over here would be what we would do for historical data. In general, the higher the standard deviation, the greater the risk. The coefficient of variation, though, is a relative measure of dispersion. It provides us with a mechanism to make com comparisons. Um, sometimes the magnitudes of the numbers will be very different, and we want to be able to uh, uh, equalize or put things on an equal playing field, if you will. So the first thing we want to do before we actually do the talk about the calculations, etc., <clears throat> is we want to look at how this plays out in the worksheet or the spreadsheet that we have. There is a worksheet it's called Standalone Risk. In this risk, you're going to input the probabilities. There's the 20, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 25. And with respect to the returns, you put those in. Again, remembering that the good's at the top, bad's at the bottom. So it's backwards from what the table had on the other, on the other table. And I've also added another asset here, asset C, that has negative 4 for good, 7, and then 12% for bad. So as we look at this data, as we look across, we see what asset A and asset B had the exact same expected return. An expected return is the mean. It's the average. Variance and standard deviation, they measure um, total risk or the riskiness of the assets. And if we look at standard deviation, you see that asset B has greater risk than uh, A. And then if we look at the coefficient of variation, the, the same circumstance holds that B has a higher coefficient of variation than A. But what about when we talk about asset C? Right? Asset C has a lower return, 5.5%. But it also has higher risk than B. So its riskiness is actually higher even though it has a, a lower risk. So you know, we might want to question some of this, these numbers. Are the numbers accurate? If so, then there's something funny about this security that it has such a high risk level with such a low return. Where we're going to go with this is we're ultimately going to now talk about once we have the statistics, we know what each return or what each asset can earn for us. The next thing we want to do is talk, talk about creating portfolios. We want to put together things so that we can have investment gains. Now, a lot of people will question, why are we talking about portfolios when we're talking about corporations? Well, a definition of a corporation is it is a portfolio of assets. It's a portfolio of projects. So when we 
create or do new projects for a company, we want to understand how that impacts the risk and return of the corporation as a whole. So a portfolio is a collection of assets. It's risk and return, right? An individual assets, risk and return, they do impact the risk and return of the portfolio. That's what we're searching for. What does it do to the portfolio? The risk return trade-off is measured by the portfolio expected returns and the standard deviations expected uh, of the portfolio, just as we did with individuals. However, it's a little bit more complicated because now we have these groups of assets that are all acting at the same time. If we assume that all investors are rational and therefore risk averse, investors will always choose um, to invest in portfolios rather than single assets. Invest, investors are going to hold portfolios because he or she will diverse away, uh, diversify away a portion of the risk that's inherent in the concept of putting all your eggs in one basket, right? People don't like risk. It's not that they don't like risk. They want to get paid for risk. So we want to make sure that whatever the risk is, and this will become clear as we get to the second part of this chapter, whatever that risk is, we want to be sure that they're getting compensated for it. <clears throat> In real world situation, the, the, the risk of a single asset would not be viewed independently. And if you think about it, everybody has a, uh, a portfolio of sorts. Everybody has a portfolio. You have more than one thing. So new investments, again, have to be considered on how they impact the risk and return of the investor's portfolio of assets. The financial manager's goal is to create something called an efficient portfolio. If we're going to add something to our portfolio, one of the goals, one of the primary things we would hope is that we could increase the return without increasing the risk. So if we keep the risk the same, we really would like to increase the rate of return when we create and add assets to portfolios. So how do we calculate the return of a portfolio? The portfolio is just a weighted product of the returns of the assets. This is expected R. That's the thing that we calculated with the individual assets. And now we multiply it by W, which are the weights. It's the proportion of money that's invested in each asset. So here we have James purchases 100 shares of Walmart at 55. So his total investment is 5,500. Buys 100 shares of Cisco at 25. Total investment of Cisco is 2,500. So the total portfolio is worth $8,000. So what are the weights of the assets? You take uh, 5,500 divided by 8,000, 68.75% is invested in Walmart. And of course, one minus that, or 2,500 divided by 8,000, gives us the uh, um, Cisco's weight, which is 31.25%. And of course, if you put those in decimal forms, right, if you add those up, they add up to 1.0. So we're still using the standalone risk portfolio, and this is how we can, the standalone risk spreadsheet. And how we can use this is let's plug in some numbers. There are boxes where you can put in portfolio weights. If we put 70% of our money in asset A and 30% of our money in asset B, what happens to our portfolio? How is it, what does it look like? Well, the weighted average, since they both earn 15%, the weighted average is 15%. But let's look and see what happened to risk. Risk is 2.68, right? So risk is, is fairly low. 1.14 is what it is for A and B. So it's in between there, but it's a fairly low number, uh, relatively speaking. So again, we can calculate the risk and return for portfolios. Now, the next portfolio is the one I really want us to concentrate on. We're going to put 70% of our money in B and 30% of our money in C. 
So now you see the returns aren't the same anymore. So the average is a weighted average of those two. So you're going to get an average return of 12.15%. The problem, though, and it's not a problem, is what we want to happen. Let's look at risk. Risk is 2. Uh, excuse me. Standard deviation is 2.31. 5.85 is the standard deviation of B or C, and 5.6 is the standard deviation of, of uh, C. So what we can see here is that what? The, the risk of this thing that we combined is less than either of the assets that's in the portfolio. And that, my friends, is what we, de is what we define as diversification. So we can find out and we can calculate this uh, very easily and show how risk disappears. And we're going to spend the rest of the chapter talking about how that ultimately happens. What's the process that creates that? We also have another uh, spreadsheet that can help us with returns. You can put the portfolio beta and return a spreadsheet. If you open that, there's a place where you can put the weights or you can put the dollar values if you have dollar values. And here are the returns. So for this portfolio, where we had 30, 50, and 20, this portfolio would average around 13.1%. Now, this spreadsheet doesn't show us the standard deviation. It's looking at something called beta, and we'll talk about that in, in the next chapter. So what about portfolio risk then? Portfolio standard deviation is not a weighted average, right? If it were, there'd be no benefit to diversifying. We have to figure out what causes what causes this reduction in risk um, when we combine assets together. The statistic that does this, if hopefully you're familiar with some, some basic statistics, is something called correlation. It's a statistical measure. I want to underline that because it's very important. It's a statistical measure of a relationship. They can be positively correlated or negatively correlated. The correlation coefficient is a measure to the degree that they're correlated. So if it was perfectly positively correlated, it would have a plus one. Perfectly negatively correlated would be negative one. So again, we want to think about correlation as just being a number that shows us how things seem to act when they're acting at the same time. Now, this isn't causal. This is statistical. So to reduce the overall risk, we want to diversify. We want to add portfolio uh, assets to the portfolios that have the lowest possible correlations. Uh, if we have low correlations, then we're going to optimize or get the greatest amount of, of diversification that's possible within a scenario of a set of assets. Um, uncorrelated basically says the correlation is zero. Now, in real life, what do we find? Most stocks are going to have a positive correlation with each other. Somewhere between 0.2 to 0.7 is the average correlation between any two stocks. Some will be a little bit lower, some will be a little bit higher, but they're going to be in that range. It's very difficult to find a correlation between two assets that's negative. So we'll move on when we talk about that because we have another slide that might introduce some of that. When you think about including international assets, now we have countries that have economic systems that work different than ours. They're not highly correlated with us. In fact, they may actually even be negatively correlated. So if we want to get diversification and we want to get the lowest possible diversification we can, we may want to consider investing in international investments so that we can get very low, even negative correlations between Excuse me. <clears throat> between the um, um, between the economies and ultimately be between the stock markets. Now, currency risk and political risk are a little unique, right? They're, they're different, and so we're really just talking about the relationship between prices. So, again, internationally, 
you know, some diversified portfolios might perform better. Um, but, uh, you know, in the end, the numbers all bear out. Sometimes international investing is better. Sometimes domestic is. The point is to reduce risk, we need to have a combination of the two. So next, moving on, we want to talk a little bit about announcements. So what is it that happens that changes prices, right? How do prices change? We talked a little bit about supply and demand and how that ultimately impacts stock prices. But essentially, announcements and news, right, contain two things. They contain information that we expect to hear, but they also contain surprises. And it's the surprise components that ultimately affect stocks. So efficient markets result when investors, when they're trading on unexpected news. Efficient markets result from investors trading on unexpected news. That is that it's easier for the trade on surprises, right? The, the more efficient stock markets would be. The more likely markets would always move the right way, the right time, the right magnitude, etc. So efficient markets involve random price changes because we can't predict surpluses surpluses or surprises. Finally, we have a, a, a formula too to talk about before we move on to the next to the next section. But the total return of an asset is its expected return plus its unexpected return. That unexpected return has two parts. Part of it is what's referred to as systematic. They use the, the M here as that variable. And they also have something called the unsystematic. That's the this um, epsilon, this little sigma. I think that's actually a sigma sign. But this little uh, uh, E shape here, right? So those are the two pieces. So the total return of a c company then, or the total return on an asset, is its expected return plus a systematic portion plus an unsystematic portion. And this is really what we're going to talk about. It's this unsystematic portion that gets diversified away. When we add securities together, this piece, the unsystematic piece, is the piece that diversifies away. Again, total risk, it's non-diversifiable risk plus diversifiable risk. Diversifiable risk comes from firm-specific random causes. These are the surprises that we're talking about. Non-diversifiable risk comes from market factors. They affect all firms. These are the things we refer to as being systematic. Because any investor can create a portfolio that will eliminate diversifiable risk, the only relevant risk is non-diversifiable risk. So the only risk that we're ultimately concerned about is this market level of risk. That's ultimately what we're searching for, to try to figure out how we can calculate that, how we can understand how it relates to prices. So what affects systematic risk, right? The factors that affect a large number of assets. In fact, they really talk about things that are referred to as market risk. These are things that affect the economy, changes in GDP, inflation, interest rates. Those are all things that affect all companies, and it affects them all the same way. It all, it's either all good news or it's all bad news. So you can't get rid of it because it affects everybody the same way. Unsystematic risk, then, is this diversifiable risk. It only affects a limited number of people. Again, sometimes we refer to it as asset-specific risk or company-specific risk. When we combine things together, since it only affects one company, other companies will pick up the slack for any um, upticks or downticks for these particular assets when these events, uh, when these unsystematic surprises occur. And of course, those things could be what? Labor strikes, uh, could be lawsuits. Those things only affect individual companies. So in the second part of this chapter, we're going we're gonna to get into this even a little bit more. We're going to talk a little bit more about how this ultimately works and, and the process of diversification.